get started, please. In case any of you are worried, your presence here does not indicate that you're going to retire, <laughs> A. And B, the administration is not taping this meeting. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about them uh, calling you up. Uh, this meeting is being taped by the union in order to be able to show it to people who cannot be here. So we will have it, and we will have it up on our website uh, when uh, Brother Tierney gets, gets the disc to us. Uh, and he's very fast, by the way. He's very fast. So uh, you're going to be here this afternoon. Some of you are uh, uh, repeaters and repeaters, as we say now in, in, the, sp in the sports world. Um, it was tough with them. That's why you gave me. La I was last time. What's that? It was very difficult with them. Last time. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So uh, that's right. there's some new faces here, and that's good. Uh, feel free to ask whatever you like to talk about whatever you like, for particular things that are relevant only to you, I would ask you to be cautious about, about doing that. But general kinds of questions are certainly always appropriate uh, for any of our uh, uh, guests today. Uh, so let's get going with uh, my favorite administrator at URI. <laughs> who is an authority on anything to do with fringe benefits at URI, and that's Pat Victoria. And if you have not met her or have not talked to her, if you're really thinking about retirement, call her. Don't waste time on doing anything else, but call her, set up a meeting, and she'll guide you through, which is really a very easy process. Patricia, yes. please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. All right, so today we're going to discuss the different phases of health insurance choices in retirement. So I have a, a page on each one of these explaining them, but these, this is the progression of health insurance when you first retire. So first there would be COBRA, which is the same medical, dental, and vision benefit as an active employee that can last for up to 18 months. And then if you're not yet 65 at the end of those 18 months, you go into what's called the early retiree plan, which is the same medical and prescription plan. Uh, it doesn't have dental and vision, and you're covered up to age 65. And then you're eligible for Medicare. So right now we have a choice of two different Medicare plans, which I'll explain as we go. There we go. All right. Oop. Okay, <laughs> so COBRA is an extension of your active medical benefit. It's the same medical, dental, and vision plan that you have now. The medical benefit, however, is only available to pre-65. Dental and vision you can take if you're 65 or over, but not the medical portion. Um, spouse and partners are eligible for the same type of benefit. And on the next page, we'll see what the prices are, but a 2% admin fee is included in the price of all the plans. Okay. Actually, I'm going to skip to, if you look in your packages to the next page, there's a full COBRA listing of all the prices and the choices that you have. But basically, you can pick and choose any portion that you want, the medical, medical dental, individual, it's piecemeal, so you can choose whatever you'd like. And I gave this second page here, which is not on the screen, but in your packet, because lots of times if you're eligible for Medicare, a lot of people still want to take the dental and vision. And it's less expensive to take dental and vision as two individuals rather than a family. Because on this chart, which is not there, but in the packet, a dental and vision plan is three times as expensive as an individual plan. Uh, I mean, uh, for a family plan. So you want to take two individuals, and you can do that. And that's why I included that. But you can do it individually. Any COBRA questions? Yes. Can you take the medical also as two individuals or not? You can, yes. Everything you can do on an individual basis, as long as you're under 65. Yes, sir. 
after age 65, can you take the dental addition? Yes. Okay. Yes, you can. So those you can take. Yes, just the not the, the medical piece. Okay. Is there another one? No. Okay. So if, if your COBRA ends 18 months, you've retired, your COBRA ends, and you're still not age 65 yet, we have what's called the early retiree plan. It is health insurance for the time between your COBRA and your Medicare eligibility. There is a $250 deductible on early retiree plan. You don't have that now, but you would on the early retiree plan. There is no dental revision that's included with it. Um, the prescription drugs are a little bit more. Right now, your prescription drug is 5, 20, and 40. This would be 7, 25, and 45. And right now, that cost is $9.44 a month. So it is a little pricey. But we also have another early retiree plan called the value plan. And the next page in your packet is a comparison sheet between the two. But the value plan is basically less medical coverage at a less, a reduced price, but there's a $2,000 deductible. Also, no dental and vision. The prescriptions are a little higher, but the cost is $593 a month. So sometimes if someone's COBRA eligibility ends and they'll be 65 maybe in two or three months, they'll just take the value plan instead of the higher price plan for those couple of months and then be eligible for Medicare. You know, maybe you've already had your physicals for the year. You don't really need to go to any appointments. So this is pretty much a plan that would just kind of transition you over to Medicare. Any questions about that one? Yes. Is there any trouble with using any of these plans outside of Rhode Island? No, it's just like the plan we have now. It's a national plan, a PPO, which is called the Preferred Provider Organization. So even if the doctor didn't take United Healthcare, there's an out of network benefit for that as well. So it's not a, it's not a network plan. Adria? If you don't go for just the dental and vision cobra, that only lasts for 18 months. Right. And then you just don't know. You're on your own. Blue Cross sells a plan. AAA actually sells Delta Dental because AAA doesn't sell to individuals. They sell to groups. So, uh, I'm sorry, Delta sells to groups only its group. So you could buy Delta Dental through AAA, uh, but you can buy Blue Cross individually through Blue Cross. Yes. It would be the, yes, the, at the end of the beginning of the next month after you retired. As long as you kind of retired after the 15th of a month, which, which you always will because you can only retire at the end of an academic semester anyway. So the retirement this year is June 27th, but your COBRA would go starting July 1st for 18 months. Yes, sir. Can retiring at the end of an academic semester mean retiring after summer program? No, it's June or December. Yes. My second question is, is there anything in a state for an extended COBRA? Some other states have that. There is. If someone is disabled when they retire, then that COBRA can go for 29 months. And upon the death of the employee or children who are losing their coverage, that can go for 36 months. Adria? Back to uh, dental and vision. Yes. What does that entail? Exactly what you have now. It's the same plan. No, the vision is only f almost five dollars a month. That's dental and vision together. Would be what thirty eight something a month. Thirty three thirty eight is thirty three thirty eight would be I think the dental, yeah. and then the vision is four seventy one. But I'm saying for so that you get it's all that you get now that you get. Now. Yes. Please. Yes. Remember, she's talking right now only about people who are not yet 65. Well, dental and vision, they can yeah, have it to, I yes, right. But, but this is for people Just pre-65. Pre right. Okay. We all set? Yes, sir. Having said the national, <coughs> this national plan, you yes. said, right? Yes, yes. If something happened in a foreign country, what did happen? If you were on our active plan or the early retiree plan, you're still covered. Um, what would happen is you would have to pay on a credit card where you are, mm -hmm. get as detailed a report as you could. When you bring it back, we file an international claim form, oh, and then you're covered. United Healthcare will reimburse you just like you were in the United States, or okay. just like you were in your home network. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, so now you turn 65, you enroll in Medicare, and when you enroll in Medicare, there are two styles of plans that go along with Medicare. Many different companies that offer them, many different kinds of plans, but only two styles of plans. And one style is called a supplement plan, and one style is called an advantage plan. So the board has one of each. With the supplement plan, it's a portable plan that you can take to any state that you go to. There's no uh, referrals. You can go to any doctor who accepts Medicare. Medicare is the, the primary health insurance, and this would be your secondary. But it doesn't have anything in it extra. It's medical only, so no dental, no vision, no prescriptions. So with a supplement plan, you would also have to buy a drug plan, otherwise known as Medicare Part D. So you would have your Medicare A and B, you would have your supplemental plan, and then you would have your drug plan if that's the style of plan that you chose. We also offer what's called an Advantage plan, but that's a network plan. It's an HMO. So you have to be a Rhode Island resident. You need to, to identify a primary care physician. You don't need referrals to go from physician to physician. The plan that we have has some dental, some vision, and a drug plan built into it for one price. But I would caution anyone who thinks that this is a great plan. <laughs> it used to be a great plan. But two years ago, United Healthcare drastically cut the network of physicians that accept this plan. So when people come in, if that's really the plan that they're looking for, we kind of look up on the uh, internet if their doctor is taking this plan anymore. Last it, year, <coughs> last, two years ago, United, without warning, eliminated a number of doctors throughout the United States and a really large number <coughs> in Rhode Island. And, so yeah. people, and people had absolutely no notice about this. They, they tried to make an appointment with the doctors and they were told we're no longer participating. And it wasn't the doctors, it was United that threw them out. So be very careful with that one. Yeah. And there, like I said, these are just the plans that the board offers. There are a lot of different types of plans around. You don't, you're not obligated to go to one of the plans, but I just show you this screen because there are only two styles. So if you understand the different kinds of plans that are out there, AARP offers plans, uh, Blue Cross offers plans. There's quite a few out there, just only two kinds. Huh? Yes? I, I know, a, a number, I think it's been several years <coughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, how does one know if a particular physician sends things out to Quest? That you really wouldn't. Um, no, you, you wouldn't know. Yeah. Right? You, you would have to, to yeah. Before you go to any yeah. physician. Yeah. And I think at the beginning when that happened, the people got caught in that, but the offices kind of know now that it, it's not really part of that network. So if you came in as a United patient, they may not use that lab. But you're right, it's, it's difficult when you don't know. Now, uh, it reminds me that sometimes people send me uh, bills that they got because they had an anesthesiologist, they had a surgery, and an anesthesiologist doesn't take United Healthcare. If you have it in the hospital, even if the doctor doesn't accept it, you're covered because you were there as, as uh, a patient in the hospital for a procedure. So you don't normally go in for a procedure and you have to be expected to choose your anesthesiologist. They just do it for you. So if that happened, even if the doctor didn't take it, you're still covered because you're under the hospital plan. Can I have one specific question? <laughs> the, uh, you said the Medicare covers everybody. Well, everyone would need to enroll in Medicare A and B before they could purchase a supplemental or an advantage type of plan. So, so Medicare will cover it, but yeah. why we need a supplement? Well, and um, Social Security, I'm sure, is going to explain this a little right. more. But what Medicare covers, it only covers 80% of. Right. So you would have to cover your, you'd have to pay yourself for the other 20 plus some deductibles. Okay. So usually people have their Medicare and then buy a, a plan that goes along with that sort of to boost up or supplement the benefits right. that uh, Medicare so would provide. So if you buy a supplement, it will cover 100%, not 80%. Yeah. 
Right, that's oh, correct. Okay. Thank you. Depending on the supplement you buy, this is the one that is 100%. And, and Blue Cross and AARP also have 100% supplements as well. Okay, yes, thanks. Frank. I, I can give an example of that. Sure. I had surgery in January of 2014 at Yale New Haven Hospital, and the, and the hospital billing system screwed up and billed Medicare rather than my mm -hmm. insurance. And because I don't have Part B, only Part A of Medicare, I received a bill from Medicare for $3,500, so it could add up quick. Yeah. I mean, if you have surgery, you're in the hospital a few days, it's a lot of money. So it's well worth thinking about getting one of these supplement plans. And as an active employee, you don't need Medicare Part B, but sometimes who's ever billing looks at someone's age and assumes that they do, so they may not bill the health insurance company, they may automatically send it to Medicare. But um, no matter what your age, our health insurance is not age dependent. So you could be 65 or 85 still on our plan. You do not need Medicare uh, Part B until you actually retire. And then there's a form that you do and there's a form that I do. And when we mail it in together, then that prevents you from having a penalty for late enrollment. Pat, wasn't it true at some point that the prices for those two plans were Reverse. Opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, um, the state separated the people that are in the pension system, their health insurance changed, but the Board of Governors didn't change the medical plans that they provide. So we had to separate from the state and the board. And it ended up that for the Advantage plan, that used to be $225 a month. No, I'm sorry, the supplement plan was $225 a month. But when they looked at the claims data, the board group of folks was a healthier bunch than the state group of folks so they reduced our rates dramatically so that's why the uh, the supplemental last year was 225 and this year it's 170 so it worked out to our advantage basically okay and I know Social Security will explain about Medicare a little bit more but basically in order to buy a supplement or an advantage plan you have to have Medicare Part A and B first um, in 2005, Part B will be a minimum of 104.90 a month, which is deducted from your Social Security check before you get it. And there is a sliding scale that was established uh, in 2007, according to your income two years prior to retirement, on how much money Medicare Part B will uh, charge. But I'm going to leave that for Social Security. By minimum power. That's the least so somebody could pay. There's four stages, I believe, of, of prices for Medicare Part B. So what, you, what Social Security will do is they're going to look at your income two years prior to your retirement. So if you retire this year, you, they're going to look at your 2013 taxes and whatever your, um, I think it's modified gross adjusted income is, um, that's how much you're, ch you're charged. Can learn how much before we retire and choose one of these? Well, most people, you can't choose, I mean, you can't help what it is because it depends on what you made two years before you retired. But most people are in the, in the minimum range. If not, I think the next jump up is 153 something a month. And then, uh, it, then it's, um, they look at it every year. This is just your salary. It's your taxes, your taxes. Adjusted gross income. Yeah. So it's whatever other income Right, right. But I'm going to leave that to the experts. <laughs> the only thing that's optional to you is Part B of Medicare. While you're an employee. You for Part A and that's free. Uh, but Part B is optional, but you'd be a fool not to sign up for it, frankly. Well, you, B is an, optional as an employee. No, Once no, you if you retire. When you're going to retire, you need B. Is that true? Okay. I didn't think you could buy a supplement, but I'm going to leave that no, as well. Me, I'm not talking yeah. about this. I'm talking about part. Yeah, I understand. Okay. So are there any medical questions before we get to this next slide? Any questions about how the insurance goes or where you fit in the, in the phases? Yes. You haven't said anything about the option of buying insurance on the state exchanges under you can do that pre-65. Post-65, I don't, I don't believe uh, ex 
the exchange would deal, um, you would have anything to do on the exchange there. So you would have to go to some type of a Medicare plan, either through AARP or United or Blue Cross. AARP is United, but it's a little different than the United that we have. Because United also doesn't sell to individuals, they only sell to groups. So AARP is the group that handles, that United Healthcare supports that group. And ours is a little group, the Board of Governors group or the Board of Education group, but it's still a group, so that's why we can offer United Healthcare. But if you called United, you couldn't buy one on your own. Okay, so SRP, otherwise known as Bruce Sunland time. <laughs> Salary reduction plan. A forced loan, yes. So this was time that was banked in 1990 and 1991 during the credit union crisis. It was based upon your salary, oh, it, your payout will be based upon, upon your salary at retirement, and there's a formula here. Divided by 244, which is the average number of days worked by a faculty member, and then multiplied by the number of banked days, which is usually 29, because that program lasted for 29 pay periods. You worked for 10 days, you got paid for nine, and one day was banked for you. So it was promised that when you retired, you would get paid out at your current rate of pay. Some people didn't believe that, so as soon as the program ended, they took the money out. You are also are able to discharge that time if you go on a sabbatical at half pay, because your salary has been reduced, so you could discharge it while you're still an employee. But most people just wait till the end and uh, take it in retirement. So that's how it's going to be calculated. Yes? Does this mean this is cut in half if you go to pay for No, it's, it's, your, it's your actual rate of pay. Yes? I know this is probably hopeless to talk about, but how did they get 244 days? Yeah. Maybe that's a frank that question. The agreement made between the AAUP and the, uh, the Board of Governors at that time. And nine times 20 is 180, though. <laughs> I'm not sure. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's where I started with the focus. Oh. Silly number. Yeah. Yes, sir. What does that typically come out to? What's the common number that after that number? If you worked the full, if you gave up the full 29 days, it's about 10% of your pay. But not everybody did the full 29. I, I don't know how they broke it down, but mostly it's 29 days. 10% of the current salary? Yes, yes. of current salary. So you are paid for this two pay periods after your final paycheck. Your final paycheck will go as a direct deposit if that's how you have it set up. And then two pay periods later, this payout will come. The payout does not go direct deposit. It goes back to your department. Because the money is still coming out of the state payroll, but you're out of the employee uh, database, so the direct deposit isn't uh, flagged on your account anymore. So it'll come out as a paper check, which goes back to your pay, uh, department on a payday, two pay periods after your retirement. If, if you were, uh, if you're around, uh, I figured it out the other day, if you were at around $100,000, it's around 11 change over the minute. So leave a forwarding address. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or leave it to me. <laughs> leave a forwarding address. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think well, this is, there we go. Okay, life insurance. If you have life insurance through your paycheck now, you are able to continue the basic only in retirement. We have basic, which is one times our salary, and then supplemental, extra. But in retirement, you're only able to keep the basic. And then what happens is we have to look at what it's valued at. A frozen value, the value of it is frozen at age 65. <coughs> if you're not 65 when you retire, it'll be whatever your income is. But if you're over 65, we have a, f a field on our programs that says what you made when you were 65. So that becomes the frozen value, but then it is reduced for four years. It goes down to 25% of the frozen value at age 68 and never gets any lower than that. The price is basically 40 cents per thousand, so that's about how much it would cost you. When you first retire, I would give you a bill from, for however months are left in that year when you retire. So if you retire now in June, I'll give you a bill for six months. And then every December, I send out an annual life insurance bill. And then people just pay by the year. You don't have to keep it if you don't want to. There's no cash value. 
it's a term life policy, so, so most people keep it going. Any questions about that? Okay. About how many people have turned down the, the life insurance? Not many. Uh, maybe the whole time I've been doing it, less than 10. Yeah, most people keep it. And that's me. So, <laughs> any questions? No. Very good. All right. Thank you. I'll get the other one. Out of there. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. That is what it is. Maybe we'll put this maybe over here, and maybe you could put this in your pocket or something like okay. that. I hope there are no Tea Party members in the room, <laughs> because you're about to hear from their, their, the agency that they, they hate the most in the United States government. Um, but it is also the agency which is the most efficient, the most effective, and has the lowest administrative cost of anything going on, either in public or private sector. Uh, we ought to be very proud of our Social Security Administration. Uh, uh, my only complaints is that the payouts ought to be bigger, but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a political problem. But, but uh, I, I just want you to know that uh, we're very lucky to have so, uh, Social Security uh, in the United States. And so we're going to hear now and uh, take good notes of this, because this, this could be complicated. From the uh, first time she's here for us today is Catherine LeBlanc. Uh, are you in Providence? I am. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you. I can get my PowerPoint open up here. Always have plan B, right? Flash drive doesn't work. My name is Catherine LeBlanc, and I am a public affairs specialist for the Social Security Administration. I work out of the Providence office, although I've worked in many offices over the course of my career. Just so that you know, any of the information that I give you today relates to Social Security rules. So if I say you don't have to file for Medicare at 65, that is a Social Security rule. So you need to know, like Pat says, that there might be some other rules that you'll have to um, abide by for your, your own retirement, like if you do retire early, then you would have to take Medicare. If you retired at 62, got a supplement when you turn 65, then you would have to apply for Medicare. I've prayed for patience, but this is a test. I think it's still loading. The thumbnails have to come up. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Great. Okay, so what will you learn today? 
By the end of the presentation, you will learn um, what types of benefits are available from Social Security, how you apply for those benefits, how, what you, do you need to qualify for them, and any documentation that you might need. So how many people in the audience have already filed for Social Security benefits? Nice. And how many people plan to someday file for Social Security benefits? <laughs> so I'll keep my hand up because um, I fall into that category as well. Well, I've worked for Social Security for just about 30 years. Would you believe I started when I was 12? <laughs> And over the course of my career, I've seen how Social Security will affect the lives of nearly every American at some point during their life. And Social Security doesn't only help older Americans, but it helps workers who become disabled and children when a spouse or parent dies. However, Social Security was never intended to be your sole source of income upon retirement. Social Security pl replaces about 40% of pre-retirement income. Financial planners recommend 70% or more of pre-retirement income in order to live a comfortable retirement. So in order to live comfortably after retirement, we need more than Social Security, right? We need pensions, 401ks, savings, investments, maybe to hit the Powerball. <laughs> so how do you qualify for Social Security benefits? Well, when you work, you pay into Social Security. Social Security taxes are taken out. Remember that old joke, who's FICA and why is she taking my money? <laughs> we don't call it FICA anymore, but we're still taking your money. So this year, every $1,220 equals one credit. We don't call them quarters anymore because you don't have to earn them in any specific quarter of the year. We call them credits. The first $1,220 that you earn gets you one credit. You do this four times, $4,880 in earnings will get you your four credits for the year. You work for 10 years earning at least the minimum. <coughs> this amount changes every year. But after you've worked for 10 years, when you become re retirement age, you qualify for a benefit. How does Social Security calculate your benefit? We don't take your high three or your high five, like some organizations do. Social Security looks at all your earnings from the day you started to work. And then we index them. We bring them up to current day dollars. There's an indexing factor that would count for inflation. So that $7,000 you might have earned in 1976 might be worth $37,000 in today's dollars. So after we index them, we scrape the highest 35 years of earnings. So that's what's used in your computation. We divide that by 420 to come up with your average monthly earnings. And that's how we calculate your benefit. When to retire is one of the most in frequent questions I was asked I've, over my, the course of my career. I've taken thousands of claims for retirement, and that is one of the most common questions. Kathy, when should I so file for retirement? Well, I can't answer that question because the best time for you is not necessarily the best time for you. It's a personal decision that you have to make based on your own personal circumstances. What's your financial situation? Do you still have a mortgage? Um, do you have children in college that you have to pay for? What's your life expectancy? Life expectancy is huge. Do you have longevity in your family? Are you healthy? The break-even point for someone who files at 62 is about 80 or 81. So at that point, if you filed at 62, you were ahead of the game until you reached 80. At that point, you start losing money. You lived, but you lost the gamble. So those are things that you have to take into consideration when you're choosing when to retire. Although Social Security can't tell you when the best time for you to retire is, we can help you with some of the tools that we have.
And the first tool is your Social Security statement. So how many people remember receiving that statement in the mail? How many people say, whatever happened to that, right? <laughs> how many people recently got one? So we can see only a couple of hands. Yeah, we started sending these statements out in 1999. We stopped sending them in 2011 when Congress cut our budget. Any guesses how much they cost us a year to print, prepare, and mail? <laughs> Over $70 million a year. So when that was the first thing to go, yep? How did they define disability? Suppose you become disabled after you retire. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that. I do, yeah, I do ask that you hold all questions. I might get to um, any of your questions okay. through before the end. So um, the, um, the Social Security statement was stopped in 2011, but in May of 2012, we made it available online. So in your packets on the left-hand side, you'll see um, how to create a My Social Security account. That's how you can get your Social Security statement. And why this is an important tool, of course it gives you the amounts that you're going to get upon 62, your full retirement age, and 70. If you should become disabled before your full retirement age, what you would get, what your survivors would get. So those are all very important calculations in order to compute how much you're going to get from Social Security. It also lists your name and your date of birth. We want to make sure that those are correct. Did you get married and not tell us, or divorced and not change your name with Social Security? Is your date of birth correct? Now we have enumeration at birth. But back when I was a kid, I walked into the office and my friend said, do you want a number? And I said, sure. So we went in there and I wrote Kathy and my mother had a fit when I got home. But um, those are things that you want to make sure are correct. Okay, make sure that it's your, your given name on there, correct date of birth. That's going to provide for a seamless retirement when you contact Social Security. But one of the most important things that we listed on that statement was your earnings. Because if I said just a couple of slides ago, we compute your benefit based on your lifetime of earnings, and a year is missing, then you're not getting credit for something that you deserve. So we wanted you to look at that, and we wanted you to look at it frequently because you might have that W-2 that, that's missing just a couple of years ago, but will you have the W-2 if a year is missing 20 years ago? It makes it harder to correct. It's very easy to correct if we have the W-2. If we don't, sometimes companies are, to, are out of business. So just very important to just look at that earning statement and make sure that you're getting credit for all you um, deserve. So the online statement became available um, in May of 2012, like we said, and we um, are recommending that everyone create their My Social Security account. We have over 18 million people who've already created their My Social Security account, and why would you want to do that? Well, let's say you were going to your financial planner. Most people don't remember what they did with their Social Security statement. We did start sending them out just recently in the fall of last year, but only on a limited basis. To anyone turning 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, or 60, you'll get one the year you reach that age, but you won't get another one for five years. But they are available on demand online. Once you reach age 60, if you have not filed a claim yet and you haven't established an online account, you'll get it once a year, about three months before your birthday. What do you need to create an account? You just have to have a valid email address, of course, a Social Security number, and a U.S. mailing address. You do have to pass some pretty stringent security questions. Has anyone created their account here? Did anybody have trouble with the questions? Sometimes um, they are pretty tough. We want them to be tough because we don't want someone who um, wa steals your identity to be able to answer those questions. So the question might be, did you ever own a 1982 Buick Regal? <laughs> did you ever live on Buttercup Lane, Buttercup Avenue, or Buttercup Street? We call them out-of-wallet questions because if somebody steals your wallet, they shouldn't be able to answer those questions and we get them from the credit bureaus. So that's why they, they can be pretty tough. We do uh, always 
still believe that it's better for you to create an account than to not have one. Because if you create one, then no one else can. So I encourage everyone to go on our website and, and um, to create your My Social Security account. What's another tool that we have? Yeah. Right, that's one thing that right, you would not be able to. Yeah, yeah, thank you. If you've had any problems with um, identity theft, then you would want to contact Social Security and ask either for extra security. You can ask for extra security, um, and they could text you. You know, like sometimes with your online banking, they'll text you a code, and then you can go in. Um, but I want you to know that we also have that. You know that green bar that goes across the URL on your, if you do online banking? That's called an extended validation certificate, and we've applied for that just to get extra security. And my PowerPoint is frozen, but hopefully it'll catch up to me. Um, so the, the next tool that we have is your, um, the retirement estimator. That's our online tool for helping you plan for your retirement. And how does that help you? Well, it allows you to play with different scenarios. Your Social Security statement is a good tool. It's a good starting point, but it only gives you three ages. 62, your full retirement age, and 70. What happens if you want to retire at 64 or 65 and a half? So this will allow you to plug in different scenarios. Um, if you're going to stop working at 60, you're not eligible for Social Security until 62. So how many people remember on their Social Security statement that it says something about what we assume? So this is the online statement, right? But there are a couple of things that they assume. It says, we will assume for 2015 and later, this is the newest statement. Um, I created my account online. <laughs> we assume that you'll continue to work and make about the same as you did in 2013 and 2014. So if you look at that figure on your Social Security statement at your full retirement age, and it gives you $1,200, but you're going to retire at 62, that's an overinflated amount because it thinks you're going to work up until your full retirement age. So this retirement estimator will allow you to say, I'm stopping at 60. What will I get at 67? So another important tool to help you with your planning. Once you've decided to apply for benefits, the fastest way to apply for Social Security benefits is online. You can apply for retirement, spouses, Medicare, disability on our website. A retirement claim takes about 15 minutes. A Medicare claim takes about five minutes. If you have questions, come to <coughs> seminars like this. Call up the local office. You don't have to go there and wait an hour to see someone. If you've been to some of our busier offices, Providence is a very busy place. It's in a federal building, so you have to go through security, take off your belt, take off your shoes, um, empty your pockets, go through a, you know, the metal detector, so pay $10 for parking. So we want to save you that. We want to offer you services in the method in which you would like to receive them. If you want to do it over the phone, if you want to go into an office, you still have that option of calling an office, making an appointment to go in there to file your claim. However, once you have all the answers, once you know when you're going to retire, if you're going to work or not, you know, all these answers, then we're just the typist. We're just going to ask you and type in all that information. So you can do it from the convenience of your home. You can have anyone help you. If you don't remember your, your date of marriage and you can't get your ring off for the guys out there, I, do you know how many times I've had to fend off fights between couples because the wife sits back and, you know, okay, what is the date of marriage? And then especially if you remember the first, the first marriage, it's bad. <laughs> so I encourage you to feel safe to file online. Actually, right now, more than 50% of our applications for retirement are filed online. We're looking to get 67% because there are 10,000 baby boomers turning 62 every day. And we have another 10 years of that. We won't be able to handle all that. So we need your help. We want you to ask us any questions that you have, but feel comfortable filing online. 
Okay, once you've decided that you are ready to file for your Social Security, when do you file? You can file a claim up to three months in advance. Don't file six months before you're 62 because your claim would get denied. It's too early. What are the questions we're going to ask? Well, we're going to ask about spouses and ex-spouses. Were you ever married to someone for 10 years? Are you currently married? Some people can get benefits on an ex-spouse's record. Some people can get ex-spouses ex can get benefits on your record. That's a lead for someone uh, for us to follow up on. We're going to ask, do you have any children under the age of 18? Do you have any children under the age of 19 and in high school? And do you have any disabled children? We can sometimes pay adult disabled children. Children who were disabled before the age of 22, who are unmarried and not working in a substantial capacity, can sometimes get benefits regardless of their age if they were disabled before the age of 22 and are still technically uh, dependent on you when you retire. We're going to ask if you were ever in the military service. Sometimes we can give you extra credit for that service. Um, we're going to ask you, are you eligible for a pension that you did not pay Social Security taxes on? Does that apply to anybody here? Did anybody pay into like a city or the state government and you'd be eligible for two pensions? Okay. That can sometimes affect the way we calculate your benefit. We're going to ask for your bank information because all payments must be made by direct deposit. And of course, we're going to ask, what are your work plans? So how many people here know that you can still work and file for Social, Secu Social Security? Yeah. So the full retirement age has changed. If, you, um, if you're not sure where you fall in, Here's the chart, and it's also on page 9 in your Understanding the Benefits booklet. So the full retirement age has changed. It's uh, maxed out right now to 67. Um, so people retiring now at this, this point in time, uh, their full retirement age is 66. Even though the full retirement age has changed, you can still file as early as age 62. You get about 75%. Um, for somebody born in that period uh, from 43 to 54, the, their full retirement age is 66. At that point, you get 100%. But if you delay your retirement past your full retirement age, we will give you 8% extra per year for every 12 months that you delay your retirement. Nowadays, where are you going to go and get 8% on your money? It maxes out at 70. It stops growing. You'll get 132%. If you decide to delay your retirement up until age 70, some financial planners recommend if you plan on working, if you want to maximize your Social Security at, till age 70, and you are either currently married or were previously married at least 10 years, and your spouse is at least age 62, your ex spouse, or your current spouse is at least your full retirement age. They recommend something called file and suspend. Has anybody heard of file and suspend? Has anybody taken advantage of file and suspend? Great. So it sounds too good to be true, right? File and suspend. Um, well, how does that work? Well, you both have to be your full retirement age. One spouse files the claim, suspends their, their payments. They don't receive them. The other spouse files and starts to collect half of the spouse's benefit. Because they're not receiving their own benefit, they continue to build theirs and they get the extra 132% at age 70. So for example, my husband and I are both full retirement age. We get our social security statements. His benefit at full retirement age is 3,000. My benefit at my full retirement age is 2,000. One of us is going to file and suspend and the other one's going to collect half. Well, half of 3,000 sounds better than half of 2,000 to me. So I say, sorry, dear, but I'm the one getting the check. Let's file. You file and suspend. I'll file, start to collect $1,500, half of his 3,000. I collect that every month for four years. And then at 70, I stop that, and he unsuspends, and we both start to collect at 70, 132% of our benefit. File and suspend. Any questions on that? Just remember it has to be only at full retirement age. Yeah? 
that's a very tricky thing to apply for. I, I can't find any way to do that online. You basically have to go in and get social security. Yeah, if, if you put that in remarks, though, if you file the application on your own, and then you put in remarks, I am filing and suspending my benefit so that my spouse can collect half of mine, they'll contact you and, and, and they'll be able to do it. Um, the other thing is, if you were married previously to a, a spouse at least 10 years, you can do that on your ex-spouse. If, if you have an ex-spouse, <laughs> And we don't call them up and tell them, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have an ex-spouse that you were married to at least 10 years, and you are unmarried, you have to be unmarried for this, you can collect half of your ex-spouse's benefit and file and suspend. They don't have to have filed, though. You can file, collect half of your ex-spouse's, and build yours up. If your, your ex-spouse is deceased, you can also do that. Obviously, we don't care of the age because they are deceased, but um, you can be re remarried if you were remarried after the age of 60, if the spouse is deceased. Yeah? I just want to make sure that in that scenario, the spouse, they do not receive their own Social Security benefit at all, and you only receive of theirs? Correct. In which the spouse receives their 100% and you're receiving half? They could. They could, you, they could be receiving it, yeah. So in other words, they could just... But that wouldn't be file and suspend. That would be, he would be filing, and you would be filing on his, and, and well, actually, you would be suspending your own, but, okay, yeah. Okay, so one person can suspend, the other person gets, so it's one and one half times. Right, because the, the, that's the normal calculation for a spouse. A spouse is eligible for 50% of... The, the worker's benefit, even if she never worked a day in her life or he never worked a day in his life. So a situation, a divorced couple, and I'm going to say, I'm, I'm thinking of someone, uh, the wife, the ex-wife goes for half of the husband's uh, social security, and then <coughs> he remarries, she still gets her half? That's correct. And then his new wife would get that. That's correct. So if there is an ex-spouse out there who remarries, if he found three women that he wanted to marry, and he was stayed married for 10 years, all three could get benefits without regard for the other. They don't reduce anyone's benefit in the ex-spouse situation. Yes? Yes. Yep. So, um, you nice segue into my next slide. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. So can you work and still collect Social Security? Yes, you can. Um, once you reach your full retirement age, there's unlimited earnings. That's why you can file and suspend at your full retirement age and keep working. Um, if you want to retire early, as early as age 62, we do limit your earnings. So this year. The limit for someone who's 62 through the month before, the year bef before they turn their full retirement age, it's 15720 That's what you can earn and still collect checks for the whole year. The year you reach your full retirement age, we're only going to look at the months before you reach your full retirement age. So if you, you turn your full retirement age in July, then we're going to look at January through June. Will you earn more than $41,880 in those six months? Because once July comes, you have unlimited earnings. If you are, are planning on retiring, but you want to work part-time, and you think you might go over the 15720 but you're not going to go over that much, we're going to count $1 for every two that you go over the limit. So example. I'm 62 years old. I look good, right? <laughs> a woman, actually, at the end of the presentation, she said to me, oh, we have something in common. I said, we do? She said, yeah, I'm 62 also. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I'm not 62. <laughs> she said, oh, good, because you look so much better than I do. <laughs> so anyway, I digress. But anyway, um, yes, so I'm 62. I file my benefits um, effective with January. And I work out a deal with, with my previous employer um, can, that she wants me to come back and work for her. 
Um, I say, great, can you limit my earnings to 15,720? She says, no, but you know, let's, we need you for more hours than that, but we work it out and it comes up um, that, that she's gonna pay me 25,720 because I'm bad at math, that's $10,000 over. But we're only, Social Security's only count $1 for every two that you go over the limit. So out of that 10,000 that I'm over, Social Security's only gonna look at five. If my monthly benefit is $1,000 a month, they're gonna hold January, February, March, April, and May, start paying me effective with June, even though I'm earning $10,000 over the limit. Same thing kind of applies in a lesser example with, with your full retirement age. Unless your full retirement age is December, um, the 41,880 would, would apply, but we're only gonna look at same scenario except we're gonna divide it in three instead of in two. Like we said, the, the month that you reach your full retirement age, you have unlimited earnings. Social Security continues to grow until 70, and then it stops. So you would want to file for your benefits at least by age 70. Medicare, even though the full retirement age has changed, Medicare is still available at age 65. Anybody who is 65 and has their 40 credits or has a spouse who has 40 credits can get Medicare. If you've been receiving Social Security Disability for 24 months, we offer you Medicare. If you've been diagnosed with ALS, or if you have permanent kidney failure or on dialysis, or have had a kidney transplant, and even if you're still working, you can still file for Medicare. Medicare does have four parts, like Pat said, A, B, C, and D. Part A is the hospital insurance, premium free. Part B is the troublemaker. That's the one that has all the rules for enrollment, which I'll get to in a minute, but that covers 80% of a reasonable charge after a $147 calendar deductible. This year, the premium for most people is $104.90. Um, <coughs> if your modified adjusted gross income is greater than $85,000 for a single person, $170,000 for a married person filing jointly, um, you may have a modified formula in calculating your Part B premium. Part C is our Medicare Advantage plan. It's like an HMO, like Pat had gone over. It's available in some states. It's restrictive, got to stay in network, all that happy stuff. Um, Part D is our prescription drug plan. Parts A and B, you file for with Social Security. C and D, you file for with your health care provider whoever that would be, um, United Health or AARP or Blue Cross. Um, we don't pick a plan for you. You would decide which um, plan you would choose. Medicare has certain enrollment periods. Generally, Part A is not the fussy one. You just file right around the time you're 65. We'll give it to you the, month, the first day of the month you turn 65. Um, no penalties involved. We just, if you file late, we, we'll, we'll go up to six months retroactive. It's, it's, it's really easy. It's like the, the, the youngest child. But <laughs> part B is the troublemaker. That's the middle child. Um, that has a, a very specific enrollment periods. If you are going to continue to work at age 65, let's say you're going to continue until you're full retirement age, and you're working and you're covered under a group health insurance plan based on your current employment, you don't need to take Part B and pay $104.90 or more per month. If you're covered under a group health insurance plan based on your spouse's current employment, you may be retired but they're working, you don't have to take Part B of Medicare. Social Security rules. Pat might have something else. Jump in if you, if, if you think um, it's necessary. The penalty for filing late for Medicare is a 10% surcharge for every year that you don't take Medicare that you could have, unless you were covered under a health, group health insurance plan based on either your employment or your spouse's employment. You can delay it, okay? If you miss your general enrollment period, and you don't qualify for a special enrollment period, or you don't have your 40 credits, anybody can file for Medicare January, February, March of every year. It's not effective until July. But the penalty would come into play if 
you were 65, you didn't have credible coverage <coughs> based on someone's employment, you decided not to take Part B because you were healthy, or you had, sometimes veterans will do this because they have the VA, um, or they have Champus or something like that, and they decide that they don't want to file for Part B. We don't make anybody file for Medicare Part B if they don't <coughs> want it. But just be aware, if you don't have credible coverage based on someone's employment, it could cost you extra when you do want it. If you turn 62 and want to retire, and we don't offer Medicare until 65, in January of 2014, President Obama passed the, um, the, the Affordable Care Act was passed. It's um, available on the healthcare.gov website here if in the state of Rhode Island. This is a national website, but in the state of Rhode Island, if you do put your zip code in, it will transition you into your, your, your state plan. Um, but it's a good option for people who don't have any other options for health insurance from 62 to 65. Once you turn 65, you would then go on Medicare. Medicare is not part of the um, Affordable Care Act, so you would then get a supplement somewhere else. What are the benefits do we have from Social Security? Social Security has a disability benefit. One in four, one in four current 20-year-olds will not make it to retirement. They will become disabled. Social Security has a protection for them on a disability. The, the definition for Social Security disability is different than private insurances or other government agencies. We don't have any short term, we don't have any temporary disabilities. Um, you're lucky here in Rhode Island you have TDI that will cover you um, at the beginning for short-term disability. Social Security's definition of disability is the inability to engage in substantial gainful activity um, dis and be, become, be totally disabled. Be have um, a condition that will last for at least 12 months or result in your death. So you have to pretty much not be working or that substantial gainful activity level is 1,090 a month. So you have to be earning under that. Um, it, it's only available up until you reach your full retirement age and then there's no more disability after that. And why is that? Well, Social Security disability pays you your full retirement age amount. That's the only benefit of, of filing for it early is because you don't take, if you file at 62, um, you can file for retirement and disability at the same time. So some people retire early because they're not able to continue to work. They, be, they're, they're, they are totally disabled. And they don't realize you can file for retirement and disability. You can file at the same time. We'll stop paying you your 75% at 62 um, while you're waiting for a medical decision to come. A medical decision takes about three to six months. While you're waiting for that, your Social Security retirement payment can be coming in. And then if you should become approved for disability, we'll boot you up to the 100%. So it's a good deal. We have surviving children's benefits for the same thing, children under the age of 18, in, uh, age 19 still in high school, or a disabled adult child who was disabled before the age of 22. Widow's benefits begin as early as age 60, or if the widow is disabled or the widower is disabled, it can start as early as age 50. If you are a widow and you have a child under the age of 16, regardless of your age as a widow or widower, you can start to receive survivor benefits. If you're caring for a disabled adult child or if that child over the age of 16 needs you to care for them, those <coughs> benefits can continue once the child reaches that age. Divorce widows or widowers benefits we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, same thing as, the, as spouses benefits or widows benefits except you have to be married 10 years, and if you were remarried, it had to have occurred after you were age 60 for regular widows, 50 for disabled widows. One last word, um, the last program that we have, a disability program called SSI. It's a, basically a federal welfare program, supplementary security income. It can pay some children who are not able to work, some adults who don't qualify for social security disability or don't have their credits, and some people who are 65 or older who have limited income and resources. We're in tax season. I hope everybody took care of that this week. Um, wrote my check out and cried. No. 
But anyway, it's favorite, favorite topic, taxes. Will your Social Security be taxable? It could be. If your adjusted gross income is greater than $25,000 if you file single, $32,000 if you file a joint return, a portion of your Social Security would be taxable. We don't give you tax advice at Social Security. We don't tell you whether or not your Social Security would be taxable. We send you a 1099 at the end of the year, the beginning of the year. Um, we will, if you go to your tax professional and they recommend that you take federal taxes out of your Social Security check, we can do that for you. Um, you complete that form, W-4-V, you can Google that and send that into Social Security. But just remember, that's a one-way train to the IRS. And there is no backing that train up and getting the money back. You file your tax refund to return to get that money back. The, the uh, four percentages you choose, 7, 10, 15, and 25. Well, that was a lot. Who's ready for a test? <laughs> <coughs> OK, just to recap, um, you've learned about our, our website, socialsecurity.gov, all the things that you can do on there, file for benefits, create your My Social Security account. Um, any pamphlet that is in your packet, any fact sheet or pamphlet, any pamphlet out that I have on the table out there is available on our website in at least 15 different languages, if you're interested. Um, up to date and um, on many, many, many topics that you might be curious about. You've learned about our useful retirement tools, your Social Security statement, the importance of looking at that, not only for the calculations, but also for making sure that your earnings are posted. You know that you can work and file for Social Security benefits and how that will affect your benefit. Once you have your Social Security benefit online account, your My Social Security account, and you file for benefits, there are numerous things that you can do with your account. You can manage your benefits online. You can request a duplicate Medicare card coming soon, a duplicate 1099, um, get a benefit statement, proof of income, change your address, your, your direct deposit, your, mail, your uh, telephone number, all those things you can do online once you create your account. If you have a pressing question at 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. and you want to call our 1-800 number, we do have teleservice representatives available to help you out. Don't call around the third of the month because that's a busy, busy time for us. Um, but they are available at 1-800-772-1213. That number is also on the inside cover of your um, Understanding the Benefits packet. I hope I've answered all your questions. Um, if not, check out our website, try and get that answer on there. You can also check us out on, you can like us on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, you can watch us on YouTube, you can even pin us on Pinterest. I've watched us on YouTube, but I, and I've liked us on Facebook, but I haven't pinned us on Pinterest. If you go on our website and you look for this little um, envelope, you can sign up for updates with Social Security. Um, it, in January, when the cost of living increase was announced, there was a press release, I got an email right away. I knew before many employees knew that there w that was passed. So please check us out. We also have webinars on different topics, um, especially Ticket to Work, getting people who are on disability back to work, back into the workforce. We are celebrating our 80th birthday this year. So Social Security is turning 80, Medicare is turning 50. And now, any questions? Yes. You brought it up earlier. Um, the question of prior employment where there was a pension but no social security. Not called the windfall yeah. of some kind. Could you? Th there may be people in the room that, that have that situation. Okay. So the windfall elimination provision applies to someone who f worked under social security and got their 40 credits and then maybe stopped and went to work for um, a municipality or a commonwealth like Massachusetts. I live in Massachusetts. I did a, uh, a retirement seminar for um, a bunch of cranky teachers <laughs> who um, this windfall elimination provision was hate applying they to. Hate it. They, don't, they do hate it, but you know, I, I just think that it's because they don't understand it. So I try my best to explain. Um, so if you are eligible for two pensions, one that you pay Social Security, that's your Social Security pension, and one that you didn't pay Social Security taxes on. When we calculate your benefit, we're going to look at 
a different way. The way Social Security was established back in 1935 was to keep people out of the poorhouses. So that was a social program. So the less income you have, the more of a return you get on your money. When you are eligible for a, a pension that Social Security doesn't know about because we didn't, earnings, those earnings we didn't take Social Security taxes out, we think you're a lower wage earner. Those people get about 55% of a return on their money or more, depending on how low their income is. For those of us who work under Social Security, myself included, um, we're only getting a 40% return on your money. So the, those people were getting an unintended windfall. So the 1983 amendments corrected this unintended windfall and it changed the calculation for those people who were eligible for a, another pension that they didn't pay Social Security taxes on. So that's why we corrected it. That was part of the reasons the trust funds were in trouble. The 1983 amendments did a lot of things. They made a lot of changes. Um, we're looking at making probably some more changes um, just due to the, the demographics. Social Security could have never predicted 10,000 baby boomers turning 62 every day. And those 10,000 baby boomers didn't have 10,000 kids contributing. <laughs> so we, they call it the silver tsunami. Has anybody heard that term? <laughs> so you have all these baby boomers collecting. And, and they're healthy. So they're collecting for a longer period of time. And we don't have that same number of people paying in. So we have less people paying in, more people collecting for a longer period of time. So Social Security was never really intended to pay someone for 30 years. And that's pretty much what's happening. When I started with the government 30 years ago, the um, average age for a male to live, life expectancy was 72. Now it's 82. But everyone in here probably knows somebody in their 90s collecting Social Security. So, and, and that's good, that, but it's, it's something that we need to look at. So we are looking at um, changing some of the things. Congress is looking at that, changing the retirement age possibly, changing the, um, the FICA maximum. Right now, you stop paying Social Security taxes on any wages over 118500 So maybe they're going to increase that wage base. Maybe they're going to increase the retirement age again. So those are things that, that they're looking at. Does that answer your question about the Well, no, because uh, isn't it true, I know for me, yeah. that I, I, had, I had work time in Massachusetts okay. uh, before Massachusetts public employees had Social Security, okay? And they just had the Massachusetts pension. Yeah. And so I know that I, I, I had to work more under Social Security to avoid that win Fall yeah. tax. So that's, that's one of the an exception to the windfall elimination provision. If you have 30 years of substantial work under Social Security, um, and substantial work is about 25% of whatever the Social Security maximum is for the year, that means that you've invested at least 30 years under Social Security, so we will pay you your full Social Security and your, without regard to any other pension. But that is one of the exceptions, yeah. Go ahead. So if you turn 65 and you're not going to uh, file for either Social Security or Medicare, do you still have to register? Yeah. We don't ask that you register. Um, no one has to file for Medicare at 65. Um, some people, there's two schools of thought on whether or not you file for Medicare at 65 when you're continuing to work. Some people say, um, well, it's free. I can f file for Part A. If I end up going to the hospital, Medicare will pay something. It'll be a secondary payer, but it might pay something. Some people don't want the hassle of having two insurances. Okay, so we don't contact you. We, there's, no, there's no letter that we send anybody. The only people that I would recommend not filing for Medicare at 65 is if you have a, a health care spending account through a bank, not through work, not a flexible spending account. But a healthcare, spe um, healthcare account with a bank, um, if you file for Medicare, that will disqualify you for that. That's the only time I would say definitely don't file for Medicare at 65. Yeah? You mentioned earlier about the breaking point for serving a 62 years of age retirement. Is there a table about break even for 62 years of age? I don't, I don't know of one. Um, that's just an average that, that we come up with. 
um, for 62. I'm sure there, there are some calculators on there, but I don't know of any. Yeah? Um, you mentioned uh, when someone starts to collect that full-time retirement, and you said for a single person, taxes begin on Social Security at 25000 If Right. If you're if you file a single, twenty five thousand. Yep. Taxes are. Um, I believe it's it's in that understanding the benefit booklet. They talk about taxes on page. Twelve. Yes. Thanks for a really clear and logical presentation. Thank you and for dealing with the technical difficulties that we, we all have experienced too, <laughs> I'm sure. I, and my question is sort of about a technical difficulty. Um, for the reasons you mentioned we might, uh, I would like to use that online uh, Retirement. benefits estimator to see what would happen if I retire uh, and then don't begin collecting benefits until a certain later point. When I go to that uh, estimator online and I click on it, I get a message saying you're not eligible to use this service. Have you I filed a claim? Today and that happened, uh, and it's happened in the past. I didn't go that far today, but in the past, I then got a message saying you can download our special calculator instead of doing it online, but sorry, this is not available for Macs, only for Windows. So I uh. hit a brick wall. I have not. No. no, but I can. Um, yeah, you have. I have not heard that at all. Uh, yeah, the um, a, a lot of some of the things that you can't access um, it, once you file for Social Security, you can't get an estimate from us because it, it's you're already, you're already collecting a benefit. One of the other things that I wanted to mention too, um, there are so many things that I could mention about Social Security. I think. That's why I keep notes so that I don't forget. But I, I, I do want to mention that when you continue to work, even if you draw your Social Security, so we say, you know, you can file at your full retirement age and still work full time. We are always looking at how much you're putting into Social Security. And we're always recomputing your benefit to give you credit for those earnings. So those 35 years are a rolling 35 years. We're not going to compute your benefit. Once you file, we never look at it again. We're always looking at it. So even after full retirement age? Absolutely. Yep. So if you, if what you're earning replaces a low year of those 35 highest years that we've used, we'll recompute your benefit and give you credit for those earnings. <coughs> yeah. Does that rolling affect the 50% uh, which the spouse receives? The recomputation does. The only thing a spouse does not get 50% of is if you delay your retirement because you chose to delay it, that's only for you. And then when you pass away, your spouse will get it. But the recomputation increases your, your full retirement age benefit, and so yes, the spouse will get 50%. Yes? What's the current maximum People ask that all the time. You think I would write it down. It's available on our website. Um, I, don't, I don't believe I have it. It gives, it gives in, I think in the, um, in the back of the retirement booklet that I have, it gives like the average, but um, thank you, I'll look that up, but um, and it, it is available on our website. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm 64, I am going to retire, uh, but I'm getting a pension from my current job if I retire. That pension is going to be my income? I really don't get involved in tax questions. That's not really uh, a social security question. I mean, social security, you know, if I retire, I get a, a social security money. I have a limited income to uh, avoid any extra tax. So, good time. Well, if you're, if you're talking taxes, then that's, you know, that's a total separate issue. But that $15,720, that limit is only for wages if you go to work. That doesn't count for any other income that you might have. Any unearned income, is, we, we don't look at that under Social Security. Well, so it's only earned income, not uh, dividends or Correct. interest. Or pensions. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, thank you for your thank attention. You. I thank you. apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, I will be available if you'd like for a little while outside to um, answer your questions. So, for that. Great recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So, um, I apologize for that. Uh, another technical glitch. I'm Liz Armstrong. I am with TIA Cref. I am a wealth management advisor out of the Providence office. Uh, I believe I have met with some of you in the past and uh, possibility you've met with some of my colleagues out of the office, whether it's in Providence or out of our Boston office. And um, what I am going to go over today are your, um, your income options. Uh, We'll talk about income options. I don't know if there's anyone here who um, is not part of the TIA Craft plan um, because some of these options may not apply to your VALIC or MetLife, but we will try to keep it as generic as we possibly can. But a lot, of, like I said, a lot of our, um, a lot of our uh, presentation will pertain to your TIA traditional as well as your other CREF and, and mutual fund options. So. Here we go. So, what we want to talk about is determining your needs, um, your expenses, cash flow, withdrawal and income options, and then, you know, steps that you can take today. So, a lot of what I tell people when we're starting to prepare for retirement and thinking about income. What we do is we will go through a scenario of what is your lifestyle like today? And trying to maintain that lifestyle through retirement. So without having to really, um, you know, you want to be comfortable. Let's put it that way. We want to take everything into consideration. Uh, we at TIA Craft retire you, uh, plan for you out to age 95. We find that our... Um, our folks tend to live a little longer than what is usually um, calculated at maybe some of the other companies. But uh, 95, I mean, I still have some clients that are about 96, 97, and they're still taking their TIA uh, annuity, so um, it's worked. Um, but, uh, and we are going on, uh, in 2020, we will be 100 years old. So clearly what we've done has, has helped folks. In the packet, um, the TIA Craft packet, there's a couple pieces in there, and I, along with the um, the brochure that's in there, what I did is I put in a few other things that last year I got a lot of questions on, and we will get to get to some of the other things. But one of the things that you want to start thinking through when we talk about maintaining lifestyle is your budget so I did include a budget worksheet for you because a lot of folks when they're going through their budget don't think there's, there's a few things that they just don't they, they miss so I, I put this in there as just a little reference to just again start thinking through through expenses This is something we also heard from Kathy in Social Security. You know, where is the income coming from? You have your savings, you have your retirement plan, you have Social Security, and we take these, and these are the, these are the sources we're gonna use to get to that goal, to get you that monthly income that you now need to replace from your paycheck. I'm not really, uh, you know, Social Security, we heard a lot about it. We know that there's a lot to it. Everybody's different. Um, but when we, we definitely take that into consideration as we're doing your planning. And I always recommend everyone to visit the website and start to look at what are your benefits. Again, calculating your expenses, that's why you have the worksheet. 
Um, don't sell yourself short. You want to enjoy retirement. Build it in. So you want your essentials, but you also want to be able to travel or go visit the grandchildren or whatever it may be. Make sure you're building that into your expense. So again, what we want to do, you know, whether you are retiring in three months, whether you're retiring at the end of this year, whether you're retiring in two years from now, um, we like to sit down or sit down with your, your financial advisor, whoever they may be, and really start to think through the plan. So there are no surprises when you're ready to, when you're ready to retire. I run into some situations where just one spouse has a retirement plan. So we need to take into consideration um, income for both. So what if the person with the retirement plan passes away? We need to make sure that your spouse, partner, whoever it may be, will be able to continue to live the lifestyle that that you know you want them to be living um, because that person could be living to 95 or 100. Health care, take it into consideration. We always build health care expense in. We typically go on the high side just to prepare. Um, we want to make sure that you have enough emergency cash and we also want to talk about what are the threats to retirement income? Uh, just something I, in our office, we ran into this week that we will, I'll share with you when we, we when we get to that. So some of these conditions are outliving your assets, loss of purchasing power, and then returns lower than anticipated. This really pertains to how your retirement assets are positioned, being too conservative or being too aggressive. So we, these are things we, we you know, want to talk to you about, you need to take into consideration. If you're so conservative, yes, you can outlive your assets. Or they could be so conservative that, um, and I'll use that TIA traditional, which I know is a mystery to so many people. Um, we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, and just having too much in TIA traditional and limiting yourself to your income later on. So we will talk about that. One of the things also to take into consideration as you start to draw income from your retirement assets, something we take into consideration, um, you know, again, we want it to last a lifetime. The, um, obviously, and we hear this all the time, women tend to outlive men, have a longer life expectancy. That's actually starting to even out, we have found. So that's why we, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, my point being, we want to make sure you're prepared for two lives for a long time. So you have these options, whether, like I said, whether it's in your TIA PREF, whether it's in your VALIC, whether it's in your MetLife, whatever plan you have, different options to invest in. Now, again, this slide goes to 2012, but it also talks about, when we talk about purchasing power, if you're so conservative, and again, we, right now we're using inflation at TIA PREF at two, point one eight um, but Treasury bills they're only going to stay slightly ahead of inflation corporate bonds real estate large company stocks you want to have a nice mix within your portfolio in order to keep up with inflation past inflation purchasing power I mean, how often do we say, what did bread cost 20 years ago? What does bread cost today? I can't believe I pay $3 for a loaf of bread. I mean, yeah. I mean, so 
think of 20 years from now. What is that bread going to cost? You need to keep up. So being too conservative in something like U.S. Treasury bills, you lose purchasing power. And what this means is after you've paid taxes. So you've got your investments, now you're paying taxes. Think about your retirement. Your retirement has been tax deferred all this time. The government is saying, okay, well guess what? Now you're taking it, enjoy retirement, now you're getting taxed on it. So think of not only the returns in your investments, but now you're gonna be paying taxes as you withdraw from your retirement account. So I always get the question, what if the market goes down for the next three years? And this is sequence, you know, the sequence of returns as we call it. And so what that means, let's just say you retire in June and you've got this nice nest egg. You need to be positioned in the event that market is down for the next three years. So if you are in investments that are not going to rebound for you. Think about it. You now have this nest egg and you're just drawing out. It's dropped. You're drawing, you're drawing, you're drawing. Now you need, you need, that, you need to help make that up. So again, these are, these are things that we want you to think through as you are thinking about taking income from your retirement accounts. And we help you or your advisors will help you thinking through that. So if you are with TIA Pref, we have a few options. We have your lifetime annuity, which is your TIA traditional. You can start taking systematic withdrawals. Interest only, up to age 70 and a half off of your TIA traditional. Uh, fixed period annuities, and then the required minimum distribution, which I get a lot of questions on, and we will talk about that. So with your life annuity, if you have some fixed expenses that you're concerned about for the next, whether it's lifetime, whether it's for the next 10 years, you may still have a mortgage when you retire that's not going to be paid off for 10 years. You said, well, I would be comfortable if I had an annuity that's going to, an annuity payment that will cover my mortgage till it's paid off. Okay, we can do that either through your life annuity or through a fixed period annuity. Once you do an annuity, it is irrevocable once you stop that. So it's something that really needs to be thought about. Systematic cash withdrawals. What I find, if you are not at 70 and a half and have to take this required minimum distribution, with the um, systematic withdrawals, it gives you a bridge from once you've retired to when we figure out what your required minimum distribution is at 70 and a half. It's much more flexible. You can turn it on, you can turn it off, you can increase it, you can decrease it. So it's a much more flexible option. You can pair that up with some interest only off of your TIA traditional. So just that sweeping the interest off of that. Again, we talked about the uh, fixed period annuities. That's if you just wanted to do an annuity for a short, you know, for a period of time, 10 years, 15 years. Um, we will run scenarios for you. So, for instance, talking to someone this morning, um, they said, what could I get from, you know, X amount of dollars in my TIA traditional for 10 years? What would that payment look like versus what would it look like if I spread it out for my lifetime? So we will, we will be running that illustration for them. And then we've got the minimum distribution. Like I said, we'll get into the um, minimum distribution. So again, here's your lifetime annuity. You can't outlive it. Instead of the uh, client who was the recipient of her husband's uh, lifetime annuity. 
So he passed away probably six years ago. They took the option of joint life. And she is living in a fabulous assisted living on the east side of Providence. And this annuity is taking care of all our expenses. And it will stop once she's passed. Um, but for her, this was perfect. And here's what I will tell you. Based on what they did, what was in their pot of money to begin with, their, their retirement fund, the fact that she's lived till 96 and what they've been taking, I can tell you that TIAA is now picking up that tab. <laughs> they ran out of money, but with an annuity, you will, we will pay it for life if you go with a lifetime annuity. Think of it as a second social security check. You can do it on a single life. You can do it on a joint life. So again, we'll figure it either way for you. You want to take care of the spouse? That's, that's a great way of doing it. Same thing with um, uh, adding a beneficiary to it. Example, husband and wife, they do a joint, but they said, what, we travel a lot. What if something happens to us in five years? TIA keeps all the money. You can add a beneficiary on that, that income for 10, 15, 20 years. You have six options, and in the other options, we are not able to... Annuitize? No, to our beneficiaries. Is it only... No, beneficiaries? we can customize it to you. So we can annuitize anything in your plan. Okay? We can do that. The, because of the TIA traditional and its restrictions and how you get the money out of the TIA oh, traditional, many times we will use that as the vehicle to give a, a, uh, an annuity. But we can take in the CREF, we can always, we can always annuitize CREF and do the beneficiary. But if you may be referring to, if, if you have your sum of money and you're just taking a systematic withdrawal, mm -hmm. something happens to you in five years, your beneficiaries get that pot of money. It's only under the annuity option that we're talking about. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Let you go. Mm -hmm. With the um, with the annuities, like I said, you can go with the fixed. Um, which is your TI traditional, you can go with the variable. Uh, you can do a combination of both. What happens with the fixed, you get a more of a guaranteed stable monthly check. If you include some of your variable in that annuity, what it does is it gives you more purchasing power, but it will not give you the stability of that check because let's for instance, in 08, if somebody was annuitizing and they included their TI traditional in some of their CREF, in 08, their payments would have gone down. If they had just annuitized and used the CREF guaranteed portion, you have a much more stable income going through, you know, going through these ups and downs. I find most often people just use their TI traditional to get a guaranteed uh, stable monthly check. We have what we call a transition benefit. Um, we don't have many people that use that, um, but it is an option. Again, you can get a, a you know a ten percent uh, during the first year, but it will reduce the subsequent payments. Like I said, very rare that we we see anybody do this, but it is. You can get a ten percent lump sum from your TIA traditional in the first year. But what will happen when you take that, t when you take that lump sum, it's now going to reduce the remaining payments because you took 10% out. You can take all of it out, can't you? Take two and two percent plus. On your TIA traditional? Yes. No. And are you sure about that? If it's in your, what's the contract, Pat, that you, um, 
Yeah, I know, but the contract that you contribute into? What? Oh, on the, on the supplemental? Yeah, the supplemental contracts you can, yeah. but on the the, the, uh, the the retirement annuity that that the so school there, is there contributing are GIA, to. Uh, contracts that allow you to take a one-time payment of all of the TI traditional A2 percent. Under the supplemental plan. The, vol the voluntary plan. It's the mm -hmm. money that not the five or the nine. It's anything that you put in over the five percent. But so we can't do that. We can't take out the total TIA and one lump sum and. Not on, not on the mandatory side. Got gotcha. yep. But we, we show you options on how you can do it other than just annuitizing it. But no, it's not available for lump sum. So when we talk about the systematic or the lump sum, um, again, on the TIA traditional, another option is if you do not annuitize it you can take it over 10 payments 10 year 10 year payments it gets paid out once a year under the CREF it's much more flexible for you systematic withdrawals again a great way of either supplementing when you start to take your required minimum distribution that may not meet your needs during retirement um, may fill in that bridge of Social Security systematic withdrawal to required minimum distribution does kick in. Now, if you just withdraw everything, you take everything out of your retirement plan, that's when you have a big tax bill. So that's why I say it's, it's you, you want to you manage that one. This is the interest only that you can get on either contract, your supplemental contract or the retirement annuity contract. And on the interest only, that stops at age 70 and a half when, um, when you have to start your required minimum distributions. This is your fixed period uh, annuity. Again, it doesn't have to be for lifetime. It can be for a, a certain number of years. <laughs> the shortest amount of time is five years. Yep. I'll give it my best shot. Let's see. <laughs> this one. May continue past 70 and a half is still employed. Will that apply to any of us? Mm -hmm. If we get anything back if we're still employed? Can we get any money out of those retirement accounts? You, it depends, on, yeah, I mean, uh, the employee contributions. Except for the supplemental. On the, yeah, on the voluntary. Besides that. Yeah, until you retire, no, it's in there. Yeah. But if you're still working, right, right. you are right. Right. The money you have accumulated at URI, you don't have to take any minimum distribution of 70 absolutely you are absolutely correct okay. but if you have money that you earn in another pension plan somewhere else okay at 70 and a half you have to take the minimum distribution that is correct okay. so IRAs SEPs if you worked at Ohio State what you have the ability to do is roll it into your TIA crap to defer those required minimum distributions. But you don't have to touch it. Correct. I just want to ask, when you talk about TIAA in some situations, in prep in some situations, I don't understand what the difference is. Could you sure. So the TIAA yes. is, a, is the guaranteed portion of your uh, retirement. Do you also need traditional? You need it's traditional. traditional. Okay, okay. It is traditional. Okay. You get a guaranteed fixed rate of return and the CREF is going to be the variable mutual funds portion, okay? The CREF is always going to be the most flexible. What about real estate? Is that CREF? That's flexible. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's not locked in. It's just the, like I said, the TIAA is where we, we really want to manage around that and really pay attention to um, 
how that's going to work for you in retirement. What, what to be thinking about. I will give you an example. We, have, we were talking about this client yesterday in the office. Um, late 80s. Um, was just living off all in TIA traditional. Wanted to be safe. Wanted that money to be safe for retirement. And we get that. But because of the restrictions on it, and he said, well, the required minimum distribution will meet my needs. Okay. It was meeting his needs when, that, when he first did it. What he did not anticipate is how sick his wife is today. And all his money is in the TIA traditional. And, can, and there is nothing that can be done about that. When TIA becomes liquid is if you pass away and it passes on to your spouse, that TIA traditional now becomes flexible and liquid. So that's why I say we really want to plan on how that TIA is going to work for you during retirement. And we do understand the safety and the security it offers you. But we also need to make sure you don't restrict yourself later on. Again, just kind of going back to the fixed, uh, fixed options. A minimum distribution. Now also, what I did in that folder, because I did get a lot of questions last year on this, I gave you a little bit of a information sheet on here of when you have to take required minimum distribution. Like we said, as long as you're still working, you're over 70 and a half, you don't have to take your required minimum distribution. Let's say you decide to retire at 79. The calculation, which I also, and we will always calculate this for you, we will continue you, uh, to assist you on that, and we will do the calculations every year for you. Um, this is the calculator that the IRS uses right here. So what happens at 79, anything that's been deferred up until this point, we will use the divisor based on your balance as of year end from the prior year. So you're 79 this year, you're retiring, your balances in your retirement plan as of 12-31-2014 was $500,000. Well, if you were 70 and a half, we would divide that 27.4. However, it's now 19.5. That is going to be a much larger number that is going to be required that you take out of that account the longer you wait. It doesn't go back to what the calculation would have been if you took it at 70 and a half. <coughs> Your things we take into consideration. And the first year you retire, do you take that minimum distribution the year you retire? You have a one-time option of deferring that first payment to the following year, as long as you take it by April 1st of the following year. But keep in mind, you will need to take two payments that year. Do, do I pay this tax or that tax? Do you pay what? I'm sorry. What about the tax? Oh yeah, you're gonna pay. Yeah, we're gonna withhold taxes for you. We with, withhold depending on your tax bracket will depend. And I also find that it takes a year, sometimes two years, to kind of figure out what is, you know, retirement, the first, first one or two years is kind of a trial and error. Could be, up oh, next year, I need you to withhold more. Oh, guess what, I got a big check back. I don't need you to withhold as much. So but is it because the arrangement we pay less tax or because it pays less tax? You're gonna pay, depending on what you take out and what your, your individual situation will be, we will want to, <clears throat> again, if you're retiring this year, 
you may want to withhold because you have, think about it, this year, if you retire this year and you have to take a required minimum distribution, you also have earned income from this year for the first half of this year. So now you also would have to take the income, you would have to pay taxes on the income of the withdrawal. So, and this is why we always like to take a look at what's going to be the better option of do you defer it, but yes, you're going to have to pay taxes based on where that tax bracket is going to put you from both the earned income and the distribution. Can I ask one question about taxes? Sure. So if it's not a minimum distribution, it's just a lump sum withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Is the tax set at 20% like it is if we were, if we were active? But if it's minimum distribution, it could be a different tax. It could be, be, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So to answer your question, yeah, distribution is mandatory 20%. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's, that's just uh, the withholding tax. It's not the real tax. Right. Right. That's with, uh, withholding. Correct. And we do withhold for the state of Rhode Island. So, like I said, we're almost 100 years old. Um, we're actually bigger than 2.92.3 billion. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is make sure you check your beneficiaries. Think about the estate planning. Look at your insurance. And when we talk about consolidating assets, when you're getting ready to retire, and you may have opened years ago an IRA at Citizens Bank, and you may have um, a 403B at Valak, and you need to start coming up with figuring out, because you're going to have to take withdrawals from all of those places. Where do I take it from? How do I take it? And by the way, if you have an IRA and a 403B, you have to withdraw from both of them. So if, if you just had all IRAs, you could take from the lowest paying IRA to, to satisfy all your IRAs. If you have you know, again, IRAs, 403Bs, you do have the ability right now or at any time to consolidate <coughs> into your TIA craft plan. Simplify. Simplify with one carrier. If you do business with a Merrill Lynch and you want to consolidate your retirement assets into one location, to simplify your life, that's what many people do during retirement. Before, we used to think in terms of don't have your eggs all in one basket. You're not because you're still going to have a well-diversified portfolio. That's not having all your eggs in one basket, a well-diversified portfolio that you're going to get guidance on. Um, but here's what I will tell you. We will help you with your income planning. We will create a plan for you. We will create a spend down scenario for you. Where do we take what assets from? Uh, we will help you with your estate planning. You know, this is a service that is provided to you through your plan at TIA Craft. So there is no cost to sit down with an advisor with at TIA Craft. There's no cost for our service. Uh, it is it is what we do. We are salaried employees. We are not commissioned employees. We are here to help you. So, what questions do you have for me? Can you talk about what special things happen upon this transition from accumulation to retirement? There are a couple of special rules. We, I just learned today that the, the, the complete withdrawal of TIA is not possible. You also mentioned the $10,000 removal. Are there any other things that are triggered by that transition? Or that are made available or are limitations? Um, your TIA traditional is going to be your most limited. That is, everything else is fluid. But like I said, you want to make sure that you're, you're um, drawing down uh, in the most efficient manner. And what I mean by that is we've ha I've, I've had clients that 
will say, hey, you know what? My bond fund rate was really bad last year. I'm just going to draw all my money out of that first. Well, what happens when the bonds come back and you have no more money in it? And all of a sudden, bonds are doing really well. I don't really anticipate bonds doing really, really well anytime <laughs> soon, but I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> um, but I'm just using that as an example. So what we like to do is help you think through that. But really, it's the traditional that's really the, you know, when you're doing a uh, required minimum distribution, we want you to pull it down proportionately from all of your accounts. Your traditional, whether it's Kreft stock, whether it's one of your TIA mutual funds, bring, take it down proportionately to maintain your asset allocation. Does that make sense? Because it helps reduce risk by keeping it, keeping it in your asset allocation model. Mm -hmm. Liz, are the fees that TIA Kreft charge you uh, when you're still working uh, the same as when you retire and uh, draw down some of this? Same. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Um, my husband was here at URI. I am not, but I'm about to retire. Can I bring my 43B to this class? Yes, you can. Yes. It is open to do it for spouses, family members. Absolutely. So if you want to, as a family, consolidate everything under TIA CREF, you can do that. Yep. Hi. you at 17 and a half, as I am. Uh, I must have to pay for the cash. So I have to take the minimum distribution. That's it. That's right. And I had a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. I'm 70 and a half. Yep. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I kill the people, I'm not. <laughs> the question that is that I must have to withdraw a required minimum distribution, RMD. Mm -hmm. The question is that I have a, uh, money both in TIA and some money also in CRE. Mm -hmm. Can I just withdraw money from one account, yep. say TIA? You can. Well, no, no, not under not under the required minimum distribution. You cannot. I have to, uh, withdraw money from uh, all the accounts. Yes. If, I have are, if you're still working, you don't have to withdraw anything. Uh, I know that. All right. Okay. And uh, you're going to work forever. You told me. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> so that's uh, the one. That's the one question. But if I have several accounts in the credit, I have to touch every. Um, Kref, and then the global. Then no, the you don't have to take it from all of. You don't have to take it from every single one of them. Uh -huh. But you can't take it like just from traditional. Or either way, the, okay, let traditional be there. I just want to. You take just want to take it from the global. Uh, yeah, just from just one. You account. can, you can. Yeah, we don't recommend it, but yes, you can. No, I, I yeah. know. Yes, but yes, you what can. To be recommended, I will decide. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. So the other thing is that, say, one year I do, the first year I do like that. Yeah. But I think uh, it is, uh, then I can change it mm -hmm. the other way. Yes. Uh, um, and, and the other question is that, the question, uh, say, I don't use all that money. I'm a frugal person. I don't <coughs> use all that money. So if I have uh, the money left, I reinvest in TIA CREF. Mm -hmm. So if you're not going to use all your required minimum distribution and you just want to reinvest yes. what you're not using, absolutely. It yes. just can't go back into the retirement account. So we, we can do a separate account. Yeah, we just do a separate account for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that separate account. Mm -hmm. Do they, they can go like a uh, traditional TIA or no? No. Uh, well, they, yes. Yeah. You could, but we'd have to set something up for you before you retire. No, no, yeah. I, I, yeah. The other thing is that, uh, can I use uh, the reinvestment to the CREP fund as usual, like the RA? Can you use the CREF? You know, yeah. CREP fund, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they, uh, and that will be the same, or they have a 
different type of service charge or all that? It would be under the, it would be under, it wouldn't be under your, in what we call institutional, right now you have what they call institutional class in your retirement account. When it comes out, and if you wanted to use one of the CREF funds in a, what we call a taxable account, you've already paid taxes on it, it now becomes what they call retail. The, the difference on the internal expense is very minimal, but it's, it, is, it is a little bit different. It's a little different share class, but it's very minimal difference, but yes. But, and I, I, again, if I can take a money out of my reinvestment fund mm -hmm. to retirement, yep. is there any uh, profit or whatever, mostly profit, you say, uh, that will be taxed, mm -hmm. but not the principal. Right, that's correct. If you wanted to go into an after tax type I of think a. We should move on. Yeah. No, yeah. You should talk yeah. to your advisor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you have an advisor that you talk to? No, I myself got to know. Okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, one more question, please. And then we're going to drop this up. Go ahead, sir. Suppose I want to pay my mortgage first although I will be giving 20% tax. Can I move the rest of my, whatever I have collected, into any account that I wanted? Mm-hmm. It can be done. Taking it out of your retirement plan? Just taking what is necessary to pay Oh, mortgage. pay your mortgage? And the rest of the funds. I wouldn't recommend it, because you're gonna have to pay taxes on that lump sum of money. Suppose the circumstances. That's a kind of an individual. We'll talk that about is, that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that uh, separately. To finish with. Yep. Do I have to start withdrawing from TIA craft immediately in June, or do I have some flexible time to think about? You have time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it immediately. April fifteenth. <laughs> April 1st of the following year, if you're over 70 and a half, if you're under 70, you are very, it's very flexible. You can do whatever you want. Well, the other side of that is, could I take my RMD out of another account that I have and leave everything in? Perhaps? It has to be a 403B. It can't be an IRA. Oh, really? Correct. They're treated separately. That. Okay, so, so let's. The stuff, is it really an IRA? It's something else. It's just under a different IRS classification, so you can't. Let's just say you have three IRAs paying three different rates of return. You can take whatever needs to come out of your IRAs out of one account, paying the lo paying the lowest. The but it count. will not. No, Pref, Valid, MetLife, any of 403B. It's treated separately. And can the Pref account be moved into a traditional? Yep, you can roll them over. Mm -hmm. So I could convert them all into the same class and then have yep. the whole RMD apply to all of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Okay. We have a question here, please. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. One more question. We really need to break this up. We have the four. What kind of union is it? <laughs> <laughs> there was the this question. Is false advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. I would encourage you to contact, uh, if you have an advisor, I left my card out at the, the table out front. If you have any questions and you'd like to contact me, my email's on there as well. I am. Do you want me? <laughs> She's pretty good. I've used her before. I'll use her again. Yeah, I want to call you Henry for a second. Yeah, I'll follow up with you. Yeah, why well, not? Uh, well, I'll give up if I can send you an email. Send me, you sent me an email a while ago and I was just too busy. All right. I'll send you another one. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Very good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I send you another one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.